This episode of Science Max is all about generating electricity. Where do we get this electricity that we use all the time? We try to generate as much as we can using human power. Plus solar energy, tidal energy, wind energy, and more. All you need to do is turn the generator. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Take a moment and imagine with me, if you will, a time when the only way to light your house was with candles or oil lamps. There was no electricity. That meant no power tools, no video games, no telephones, and worst of all, no TV. Fortunately, we live in a world of electricity. If you've ever lost power in your city or neighborhood, you know how hard it is to get by without electricity, even for one day. But where does it all come from? Where do we get this electricity that we use all the time? We make it. That's the cool thing. And I can show you how to make it as well. Check it out. All you need is an electric motor. Electric motors are pretty simple. All you do is get a battery, and you attach it to the electric motor, and that makes it work. There we go. Attached to the battery, it spins. But if you spin the electric motor, it creates electricity. And that's what we're gonna look at today, creating electricity. We're gonna build a wind turbine, but first you need an electric motor. And you can probably get one from a broken toy. Just make sure that the toy is broken and that the broken part isn't the electric motor. Here's what you need. Index cards or construction paper, scissors, push pins, science tape. It's the same as invisible tape, except I use this one for science. A cork, chopsticks, craft sticks, and modeling clay. And remember, all the steps for this experiment are on our website. To begin, cut the index cards into strips and tape down a push pin so it sticks out. Then fold over the index card and tape it together. Then stick the pin into the cork and repeat that step. If you want as many blades as you can get on your fan, you're welcome to do that. Next, take your modeling clay and stick the chopsticks in. Then tape the craft sticks in between with science tape. Then take the motor and stick the cork on the end. Then wedge the motor in between the craft sticks and tape it down so it stays put. And there you go a fan that will spin in the wind. You want to adjust the fan blades so they all face on a bit of an angle. That way they will catch the wind and spin. There we go. Now when it spins, it will create electricity. I'll show you with this. It's a multimeter. And a multimeter measures little amounts of electric current. There. The hair dryer makes wind. Spinning the fan blades, and <laughs> we are creating electricity. Now, pretty much all electricity that you make comes down to turning a generator. A small motor like this isn't gonna produce a lot of electricity, barely enough to power one tiny little LED, but it's a start. And a good start is all we need, because, mm. Today, on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna look at all kinds of different ways of generating electricity. Plus, I wanna find out just how much electricity one human being can generate. Although, one human being is gonna be kinda lonely. I'm gonna need an expert. Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Center. He can help. I wonder if he's busy. Well, come on. So I was wondering if you could help me with an experiment. I want to generate as much electricity with human power. What do you think? I think that sounds awesome. Okay, great. Let's go back to Science Max headquarters. Is that the portal? Yeah. Don't worry, all the kinks are worked out. <laughs> I know what it is, it's this. Where did you end up? I was in the vents. Oh, I ended up in the bathroom. All right, well, now that we're here. Okay, so this is what I started with, and this is uh, just, you know, an electric motor, right? Right, right. Um, so you can generate electricity, you spin it, so I figured in order to generate more electricity, 
you get a bigger generator? Exactly, yeah. The bigger the generator, the bigger the magnet, the more the copper, the more the electricity. Oh, uh, well, you know what we should do is we should just get an even bigger one, like a giant one that they use in like at a power plant or something, or? Mm, not quite. That would be too big for a person to be able to turn. It'd just oh. be impossible. So you think this is a good size? I think this is a great size. Okay, so that's that's good. This is called a multimeter. We're gonna hook up the wires. I will do black to uh, black. Black to black. To red. And as you turn our generator, we can see just how much electricity we're, we're generating. Okay, so. Here, you hold on to that. This, and, and I'll can turn start the turning. generator. Now it's time to play How Much Electricity Did They Make? 2.4 volts, yeah, it's not bad. Oh, 2.4, yeah, it's not great. That's just enough to power a small LED flashlight. Better keep trying, boys. I got some handles here that we're going to attach ah, to the end of the generator so yeah. we can spin it. Okay, let's try. Huh? No matter how fast I crank the large handle, I couldn't make any more electricity than before. Okay, let's um, try something else. I get, I, but it's a smaller handle. Perfect, okay, <laughs> yeah. That's good? Yeah, well, maybe it'll let us get more spins in. Oh right. yeah, because I don't have to make as big a circle. Exactly. Yeah, it's working already. We're up to like 3.5. Now, how much electricity is Phil making? 4.5. That's the same as three AA batteries. Maybe enough to power a toy car. Still a long way to go. Yeah, it's, it's a lot higher with the faster spins. Oh, all right, all right, you, you okay? I'm okay. Maybe we could use like some gears or something like that. Oh yes, you know that's a good idea because the the this circle that I'm making here, I can only go so fast. So yeah. Maybe with gears you can do one circle here equals like ten circles on the other gear. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, so kind of like the like the gears on on like a, on like a bike. Yeah, the gears on a bike or something like that. A bike, oh, of course. Oh. Yeah. So okay, so we get a bike and we attach the back tire to. The generator. The generator, and then you can use the pedals of the big gear to power the small gears. Okay, great. Right. We'll go get a bike. Yeah. Yeah, high five. Uh, All, right. All right. Oh, right, they're over here. This is a generator. It generates electricity when you spin it. But how does it work? What wizardry is inside? Well, actually, generating an electric current is fairly simple. All you need is two things. First, you need a conductor, like this coil of copper wire, and you need a magnet. Now, this is a galvanometer. It measures small amounts of electric current, and I have my copper wire attached to it. Watch as I put the magnet inside the copper. I get a little bit of an electric current, and then I take it out, it goes in the other direction. A little bit going this way, and then I take it out, a little bit going that way. Positive, negative, positive, negative. This kind of current that goes back and forth is called alternating current, or AC. It's the same kind of electricity you have in your house. But here's the cool thing, watch this. I put the magnet in and I leave it. It goes back to zero. You only get electricity when you move the magnet. All right, so let's create our generator. Instead of starting with a copper coil like this, what if we just had the magnet and we have it staying still, like that, and we move the conductor past it, like spinning, hmm? It's good, but not great, because we're only getting a little bit of electricity as it passes. So, let's make it more efficient. Let's put in some more magnets. One on either side, and one on the top. And now when we spin it, it goes past all of these magnets, and every time we get a little bit of electric current. Well, this is how a generator works. If you take an electric motor or a generator apart, you can see there's a coil of copper wires on the shaft, and it spins around like this. And on the inside, there are magnets. So there you go. When you put it together and spin it, you get an electric current. Or if you put an electric current in it, it will spin, just like an electric motor. And that is how a generator works. Anthony and I are trying to create as much electricity as we can using just human power. But so far, it hasn't been going so well. It all comes down to how fast we can spin the generator. Maybe we could use like some gears or something like that. In order to get it spinning really fast, we're gonna use a bike. It's just a matter of getting a bike, taking off the wheel, 
putting it on a stand. It is now a stationary bike. It'll be even more stationary once we screw it down. And attaching the generator. All right, the bike generator, bike rater. What's what should we call this thing? Uh, bike nomader. Bike nomader. Mm -hmm. I like it. So okay, let's go over what we've got here. Okay, so we've got uh, two gears. We have got a big one. We got a small one. We turn our pedals, and the, the big gear turns the small one. So this this is the whole point of this build is so that we can get one revolution here means a whole bunch is spinning Exactly. There. The right, more right. we get here, the more our generator spins and the more electricity we get. We get tons. Awesome. And uh, obviously using bike because you're using your legs. Uh-huh. The strongest. strongest muscles in your body. Awesome. Uh-huh. Okay, so now what's with this horn? <laughs> That is a loud horn. I know, I know, I tried to warn you. That is great, I love that. So Anthony and I hop on and give it a pedal. We pedal as hard as we can and we produce a pretty good amount of electricity. How much electricity did they produce? We got up to maybe like 18 there. We did a pretty good job. That's enough for a power tool, like a drill. It's, it's good, you know what? This, this works well, I think, for keeping a good number for a long period of time. Yeah. So we can get up to like yeah. 18, 20, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, we can't really get any higher than that. Yeah, you know what we need is like one really hard pull like all of a sudden. That way you can get like a spike. Yeah, you're right. So it's like instead of putting all that effort into a going for a long time, yeah. you put all the effort into one quick motion. Exactly. Yeah, good idea. So you wrap a rope around here and then you just pull it. Exactly, exactly. And that'd be a really fast motion. Uh-huh. Spin it really quick and get a very high number. High spike, exactly. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we're gonna have to take the bike apart though. Uh. Okay, well, right. just, well it's yeah. science. Okay, cool. So I'll just get Oh, you know what? We actually don't have to take the whole bike apart. We just have to take the generator off. Oh, right. Okay, okay hang cool. on a sec. I got it. And maybe we should attach the horn to the next thing, too. some electricity. But what do you choose to generate that electricity? Hydro, nuclear, coal, solar? Who knows? I do. I know. And soon, so will you. In order to generate electricity, you need to turn the generator. Turn the generator. One of the most common ways to turn the generator is to use one of these. It's a steam engine. Usually they're a lot bigger. You see, you heat the water to boil it and turn it to steam, which works a piston, which turns the generator. Huh? Pretty amazing, right? But what it really boils down to is heating water to make steam. Boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Coal power. Burn the coal to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Natural gas, that's different, right? Nope, burn the gas to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Nuclear power, that's different, right? Nope, it creates heat, which you use to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Wind power, we don't even need heat for that. Just use the wind to spin the fan to turn the generator. Hydropower. Just pour water across something that spins to turn the generator. No matter what, making electricity always comes down to turning the generator. It's always yada yada, yada yada, turn the generator. Except for solar. Solar does not work like that. But other than that, it's always yada yada, yada yada to turn the generator. And now you know your electricity generation. <laughs> hey, Ramona, you wanna come and give me a hand over here? My arm is getting tired. Whew, it is hot out here. Oh, in order to generate electricity, you need to spin a generator. Most forms of electricity generation work like that, but not solar. Solar panels like this one generate electricity from the sun's energy. So how do they do it? Well, 
This is a solar panel. Okay, it's not really a solar panel. I just sort of put this together, but it works the same way. There are two plates, and on these plates are electrons. I've got golf ball electrons up here, ping pong ball electrons down here, but they're all the same thing. Now, this happy little fellow is a photon, energy from the sun in handy dandy particle form. What happens is photons come from the sun and hit the top plate and knock some electrons from one side to the other, like this. And that knocks over some electrons. Now these extra electrons travel up a wire in the form of electricity and we can use them to do work for us. Then they change to the other charge, go back, and we start the process all over again. That is how solar panels work. But remember, it only works when there's sun and photons. <laughs>
And as I fall, that spindle will turn. Exactly. And hopefully, the speed of me falling and holding and yanking it down as hard as I can will be the biggest spike of electricity yet. That's right. We'll be measuring it on our multimeter. Here. OK. OK. Ready? You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Three, two, one. I jump down, and my whole body weight pulls on the line. <laughs> Like our biggest spike ever. That was amazing. All right, high fives. Yeah. Biggest spike ever. Is it enough to power my house? Nope. How much electricity did Phil generate? Almost 30 volts. How much does he need to power his house? 120 volts. He's still off by quite a bit. Well, we've learned something. Nuclear, uh, wind, hydro, uh, solar, natural gas, coal power. It's all great ways to generate electricity. Yeah. And human power. Not so much. Not as good. No. But human power is more fun. Yeah, way more fun. Yeah, so you, your turn? Yes! OK, OK. Me, you me, take me. the helmet, and I'll take the multimeter. OK. And then we'll go, and we'll do it again. OK. OK. Wait, I got to wind it up. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Math Experiments at Large. This episode of Science Max is all about liquids. Uh. What makes something float or not float? Oh no, my loonies! Liquid density and super absorbent gel. Who wants to do an experiment with diapers? Liquids. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Hey, welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. I'm Phil McCordick, and hold on a second, I'm just gonna change. Okay, that's better. Now, uh, where were we? All right, let's go make a boat. So you know that some things float and some things sink, like rocks or wood or uh, full water bottles and empty water bottles or uh, carrots, foam, waffles, screwdriver, playing cards, plasticine, tinfoil, potato, my watch. Hmm, wait. That wasn't, that wasn't supposed to go in there. So how, oh. So how do you make a boat? You make it out of something that floats, right? Well, most boats are actually made out of metal. Tin foil is metal and, well, it sinks. But if you fold tin foil into a boat shape, it floats. And boats don't only float themselves, but they can hold people and cargo. In fact, there's container ships crossing the ocean at this very moment that are holding thousands of tons of cargo, and they're all made of metal, which doesn't float, it sinks. So how do boats do it? Are they magic? No, of course not. Boats are science. And here, you can be science maximites. Get some tin foil and cut it into the same size pieces and fold a couple different shapes of boats and see which one can hold the most weight before sinking. And now it's time to max it out. But before we do, here's how you can fold your own tin foil boat in less than 15 seconds. First, take a square piece of tin foil, then fold it in half. Fold one corner down and the other corner down. Then open it up and ta-da, you're done. If you want instructions on how to fold a more complicated boat, go to our website. I have a feeling I'm going to need a few extra lab coats for this experiment. Like I was saying, let's max out the tinfoil boat and find out a little bit more about why boats float. Yeah, I thought I was going to come in over there, but I, 
I came in on the water sled. I think I had the coordinates wrong. Anyway, this is Husnia, and she's from Let's Talk Science, which is all about science education, right? Yes. Just like us. So you're gonna help me max out the tinfoil boat. I think I dropped it in the water. Hold on. Whoa! Boat. The tin foil boat. Bill, this is a boat. Well, it looked a lot better before I came down the water slide, but that's the idea. And then we make it bigger. What do you think? Uh, I don't think it's gonna work. Bill. Oh well, why not? Tin foil is very thin. Uh huh. And it might not hold the shape of the boat. Well, I still think we should use tin foil though. Why? Well, because the small experiment was tin foil, and I bought all of this tin foil. Then let's do it. Tin foil? OK, high five. I will, um, I'll take the tin foil, and you take that. And um, I'm going to have to dry off at some point. Welcome to Shipbuilding for Pirates. I'm Swabby, and I've built some of the finest pirate ships for some of the finest pirates this side of the Caribbean. And I can teach you to do the same. But first, you need to know your basics, mass and volume. Let's start with volume! <laughs> but not that kind of volume. Which of these two chests do you think has more volume? Right, this one here. Which of these two balloons do you think has more volume? Right, this one here. Volume is how much space something takes up. Which of these two chests has more volume? Hmm? That's right, they're the same. But which of these two chests has more mass? Which is heavier? Hmm, hard to tell, isn't it? But what if I told you that this one was empty and this one was full of treasure? Oh, ho, 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 ho. loonies. Now, which one has more mass? Hmm, that's right, this one. These two chests have the same volume, but this one has more mass. This chest has more volume than that one, but this one... My loonies! That chest does not have as much mass. Volume is how much space something takes up, and mass is how heavy something is. And when you look at them both together, you're looking at density. Join us next time on Shipbuilding for Pirates, and then we'll look at how volume, mass, and density work together to make something float. Oh, my precious, precious loonies. Are you all right, my pretties? They can't talk, so I'm not sure what they're saying. So, Husni and I get to work constructing a large tinfoil boat. Our first design is just sort of a square, folded together out of a very large sheet of tinfoil. Simple, but can I ride in it? <laughs> there we go. A giant tinfoil boat, just my size. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it's too thin. You, th you think it's too thin? I feel like yes. Well, what should we do? Do you want to test it? Let's test it. OK, good idea. So here's, here's the most important question. Do you want to test it, or should I test it? No, 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 you test it. All right, here we go. Putting it in. First test, does it float on its own? Yeah! Floats on its own, no problem. If I just get in very carefully, then it will work fine. See, if, I, if I'm if i careful about how I get in, no, it's, it's fine. See, if I just get in like that. Oh, my. Bill, Bill, are you OK? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's sort of, it's sort of, no, that's just air. You know what went wrong? It wasn't boat shaped. I think if we make it look more like a canoe, because canoes float, if we make it look like a canoe, it'll work great. No, 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 Phil. We need some support. If we add a couple of structures in between, then we add support to it. I'll tell you what. Let's make a boat like I want to make and a boat like you want to make, and we'll see whose is the best. That's a good idea. OK, let's do that. All right, let's do it. Welcome back to Shipbuilding for Pirates. I'm Swabby, and now we know what volume means, what mass means, and that together it can tell you something's density. Now let's find out why things float. Let's... 
Let's say we're out to sea and my treasure chest gets swept overboard. Oh no, but it's all right, it floats because it pushes enough water out of the way, displaces it to carry its mass. But what if my treasure chest had more treasure in it? Well, we're giving it more mass, but not more volume. Too much mass and not enough volume, and it will sink. Oh no, my loonies! You need more volume if you want to float more mass. And that is why things float. I'm Swabby, and thanks for joining me on Shipbuilding for Pirates. So, the first version of the tinfoil boat didn't work out too well. Like that. Oh. But my idea is to build a tinfoil boat more like a canoe to see if a different shape makes any difference. Tinfoil canoe! Very Canadian. Very Canadian. The canoe part, anyway. I don't know about the tinfoil part. So, Husni and I had a bit of a disagreement of why the last boat didn't work. I thought it was because it wasn't shaped enough like a boat, so this one looks like a canoe. What I thought is that it requires some structure. Structure so that it wouldn't fold together. That's right. And we'll see how it goes. All right. All right, here we go. Did it work? No. OK, your idea next. Did you know it's easier to float in salt water, like in the ocean, than it is in fresh water, like a lake or a pool? That's because not all liquids are created equal. They have different densities. This is fresh water, or it doesn't have anything in it. And this is sugar. If I was to put one scoop of sugar in this water and stir it around until it dissolves, now this liquid is more dense than before I put the sugar in. Here's an experiment you can do at home using liquid density. This glass just has regular water with yellow food coloring in it. This glass, green food coloring, and half a cup of sugar in it. This one has a full cup of sugar in it, and this one has two cups of sugar in it. Now, when you do this at home, you'll definitely want an adult to help you because you have to heat the water if you want to dissolve that much sugar in one glass of water. I'm gonna put them all in one container. You can do this at home, and when you do, I suggest you use a very small container because you have to be very careful when you put the layers in. You can use a turkey baster or a straw. When you put your finger on top, the air pressure will hold the liquid in, and you can just drop it in. But these kind of take some time, so I'm going to use the syringe of science. I'm gonna use the most dense liquid first because that's the one that's gonna to want to be on the bottom. I carefully put it on the bottom of the container. The next layer, be very careful, and you'll see that the red and the blue aren't mixing because they have different densities. The blue is heavier than the red. We'll add the green, and you can see even when it drips into the red, it comes back up to the top because the green liquid isn't as dense as the red liquid. And the denser liquids push the lighter liquid up. And now we're gonna add the yellow, which of course has no sugar in it at all. And there you go. All the layers stay separate. If you put it on a light, you can really see it. Liquid densities. Now, let's max it out. Ta-da! the longest length of liquid layers. 12 liquids all organized by density. Starting from the bottom, we have honey, corn syrup, chocolate syrup, maple syrup, dish soap, whole milk, water, dyed blue, vegetable oil, extra virgin olive oil, rubbing alcohol, baby oil, and lamp oil. Liquid density. I really, really want to mix it up, but it took me a long time to make this, so I'm not going to. Our first two attempts at a tinfoil boat haven't gone so well. Husnia's idea is to make a tinfoil boat and add some more structure, because the tinfoil just wants to collapse when I get in it. So we start with a large piece of cardboard on the bottom, then we wrap the tinfoil around it and shape it into a boat. After that, we add some supports across the top to stop it from folding in when we add my weight to it. This boat feels a lot 
stronger than the one I was just in. I told you. So how does all of this work? So we got some support using broomsticks mm -hmm. and then some cardboard paper. And then underneath, we have cardboard. cardboard. And so how will all of this help the boat not sink with me in right. it? Right. The broomsticks will prevent it from folding this way, yeah. and you won't sink. Good. The cardboard will prevent it from folding this way, and you won't sink again. Not sinking is my favorite thing to do in the tinfoil boat. All right, so let's try it. Let's do now, it. Are you going to get in this one? I'll tell you what, Phil. If you get in and you don't sink, I'll go after you. Deal. All right. All right, here we go. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's sort of working. Oh no, oh no, water's coming in. It's sort of working. It's almost working. Show me this. Another thing I learned is that a very light tinfoil boat can be very heavy when it's full of water. I don't know if fixing it is in the cards. I think we, I think we're gonna have to build another boat. Mm -hmm. So what do you think we should do? Let's add more structure. More structure? Oh yeah. What if we add like a metal rod around the outside and maybe some more metal rods and ribs? And we wrap it all in tinfoil, and you think it'll work? Let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Uh, don't worry about it. I've got this. No, I, I get it. I'll get it. Sure. Oh, oh, yeah. Who wants to do an experiment with diapers? Oh, oh, oh. No, no, I'm, I'm serious. You may have a little brother or sister at home, which means you probably know where you can find some diapers. But there are two things you need to remember. First, ask an adult if you can use the diapers for your experiment. And two, only use unused diapers. OK? OK. So you take the diaper, and if you cut it, be very careful. Maybe get an adult to help you. Over some black construction paper, like I have here, and you shake the diaper over the construction paper, you'll see that there's a little powder that comes out. And this is the secret ingredient. This is super absorbent gel. What it does is it soaks up all the liquid, and diapers are full of them. And you carefully pour it into a plastic cup, like that. Now you can see I have already done it with a number of diapers. It's important to use a plastic cup because it's a little messy, although it's non-toxic, it's totally safe, but it's still easier to clean up by just throwing the cup away. Now, add some water, and what happens is this super absorbent gel absorbs the water and turns very quickly into a paste. Look at that. Now, let's max it out. Five kilograms of super absorbent gel, 500 liters of water, now, it is time to do science! <laughs> and I have my own stir stick! <laughs> yep, definitely coming along. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure if we're getting anything on this camera, but I want to make sure it's recording. Yep, it's recording. There we go. It is definitely turning solid. Well, there you go. The giant super absorbent gel experiment. Corey, Trevor. I need some help getting out. <laughs> How many outfits have I been through in this episode? How many outfits have I been through in this episode? Anybody have a towel? There you go. Thanks, buddy. That's that's great. <laughs> Husnia's idea of adding structure to the tinfoil boat was definitely right. We just needed to go further. 
So we did it again. This time, we made a much larger boat. We started with a sheet of cardboard, then wrapped the tinfoil around and added some metal supports taped to the cardboard across the boat this way to make ribs, as well as some other supporting pieces in the front and the back. Then another metal rod all the way around the top, and finally, supports across the middle. All right, feel how strong it is. I'm really excited about this version of the tinfoil boat. What we did is we used thwarts, uh, big hard pieces of wood that we did last time, but this time we have ribs. Ribs, right, which are made of a cardboard, a metal rod attached to it, and... And shaped, and we did a whole bunch of them in the, the whole length of the boat. And then we used all of this bendable metal, and we have one that runs all the way around the gunnels, and a whole bunch that run down the inside, and we even use bike fenders at the front and the back of the boat to give it super rigidity so that it hopefully won't go like all the other boats have done so far. Are you ready, Husnia? Let's do this. One, two, three, lift. All right, let me get over. It floats, but that doesn't tell us anything because they've all floated at this point. It's only when I, I get into it. Okay, here we go. Hey! Hey, it works! Whoa. All right. Oh, it's working! <laughs> Look at that! It works perfectly! The tinfoil boat experiment has been done. Science Max, experiments at large. What do you think, Christina? The only reason I got into this boat is because I knew it's going to work. Really? Oh, yeah. So you knew you would never get wet? See, I don't think that's fair. I think it's time that you, you, that you got wet. Yeah, I think we should yeah, go. No, no, I think no, you and I no, should just no, get no. wet right now. <laughs> just need... Someone help. Whoa. Whoa. You're still dry, aren't you? Okay. That is so unfair. This episode is all about chemical reactions. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom delicious. Reactions to make things fly, to make things glow, to make things pop, and to make things fly. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Wait, did I mention the flying? I'm, I'm sure I did, but I'm mentioning it again because it's awesome. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Okay, Science Maximites, prepare to heart go through the cosmos. I am Captain Phil, and today we're going to be building rockets on Science Max. Now, we've, we've built rockets before, like this one, powered by air pressure. And this one, stomp rockets, which were also technically powered by air pressure. Air pressure rocket! But today, Science Maximites, we are going to be building rockets powered by chemistry! Chemical-powered rockets! Away! Mm. Okay, I promise it'll be more exciting than that. Because today, Science Maximites, we are going to be looking at chemistry. Chemistry is when two molecules combine to make another molecule. Like magic, ooh. So let's take a look at what will be powering our chemical rocket. This, it's an antacid tablet. When you put an antacid tablet in water, it makes little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. This happens because of a reaction between two kinds of molecules called acids and bases. Like vinegar and baking soda, but all contained in a small package that won't start working until you put it in water. If we contain the reaction, the carbon dioxide gas builds up and creates pressure. High five for science. All right, so let's look at our chemical-powered rocket. What you need is one of these. This is a... This is a film canister. And ask your parents what that actually means because they're not used for holding film anymore. You can get these at craft stores, though, to hold paint or little things. But really, all you need is a plastic container with a good lid that snaps on nice and tight and keeps the air in. And then, of course, what you need are your antacid tablets and a little bit of water. So pour in some water and then put in your antacid tablet and snap the lid on. Flip it over and wait for the carbon dioxide gas to build up, which will build up pressure, which will... 
launch your rocket. Ha ha, so there you go, a chemical powered rocket. Come on, let's max it out. So first, I need an expert to help me. Um, let's, oh, Lisa from Logix Academy, of course. Logix Academy people have helped me launch all the rockets on Science Max. This is gonna be great. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get my helmet first. <laughs> okay, let's launch. Let's launch some rockets! Let's go! Whoa, wow, it's really dark in this room. I can't see anything. Bill? Lisa? Bill? Lisa? Put Bill? Oh. 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 Where did this come from? Uh, I guess the portal's malfunctioning. Hey, Lisa! Hi! From Logix Academy, great to have you here. Great to be here. Let's put this over there. We are here to max out the chemistry rocket! Ooh, what is that? It's just a small plastic container. But when we put an antacid tablet in there and some water... Ah, we get a chemical reaction. We get a chemical reaction, and so that's what creates the pressure and then that pops the lid off and we get a little rocket. Kaboom! But now we're going to max it out. Get a bigger container Ooh, and more... Wait. What? How about if we launch a whole bunch of them? Ooh, so we just get a lot of the small one mm -hmm. and we launch them all at the same time. Exactly. Okay, great. So we just need a whole bunch of these and yeah. a whole bunch of... And a whole bunch of science antacid. Yeah, well, that's okay. I get them both in bulk. Come on, <laughs> let's go, go put it together. And I'm a base, and we are enemies. <gasps> oh, well, we're not really enemies. Yeah, that's true. It's all about how we react chemically. You see, as an acid, I really want to give protons away. Protons, who needs your protons? Get your protons here. Protons, I got more than I want. I don't need them anymore. And bases, we need protons. We'll do anything to get them. Uh, protons, you can protons away. I'll take some, I'll take some protons. You think that when you get these two together, you'd have some pretty great chemistry. But the truth is, when they're together, they often don't react. Whoa. That is, until water gets involved. Once you have water, acids and bases react. Whoa. Here, take some protons. All your base are belong to us. <laughs> you take some protons. I don't need more. I want there more. I want have more some protons. protons. Here. Water is a solvent, allowing the chemical reactions to take place. <laughs> Depending on the strength of the acids and bases, that reaction can be mild, would you like a proton? Oh, no, really, I could. Please, please take it. Oh, well, thank you, that's very generous. Have another. No, perhaps, maybe I will. Here's yes. one. Okay, um, maybe just one. But if the acids and bases are strong, the chemical reaction can be really extreme. <laughs> this is what's going on in the antacid tablet, and why, without water, nothing happens. Oh, water! Water! Come on! What'd you do? What? One. Lisa and I are maxing out our chemical-powered rocket not by making it bigger, but by making more of them. How many more? 400 caps all glued down, 400 antacid tablets, or part of, yep. all glued down, and they're glued on this fancy-pantsy spinning surface. Hmm. So we rotate this part upside down. We fill each container with a little water and snap it on underneath. This way, the antacid tablet and the water don't mix until we flip it back over. It also allows us time to snap them all on. Okay, ready? Ready. All right, 400 containers. Here we go. Let's do it. Once we flip the board back over, the reaction started taking place, building up carbon dioxide gas and increasing the pressure until... Oh. Whoa. So high fives on that. Yep. That worked spectacularly. That was awesome. So we've done this. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. bigger. Oh, okay. Definitely. So let's go and we'll clean All this right. up afterwards. Yep. Okay. Let's do it. Okay, let it go. Whoa. 
This is a balloon, and this is an orange. When you put them together, a chemical reaction happens. Ah, how'd you go in there for a minute, didn't I? Hit? No? No? All right. Well, you can actually do a chemical reaction between a balloon and an orange. You see, balloons are made of latex, which is a kind of polymer that's very, very stretchy. And orange peels contain a chemical called limonene. Limonene breaks down latex. <laughs> so, we have three questions. The first is, why does this happen? Well, like I said, it's all chemistry. You see, balloons are made of polymers, chains of molecules held together by chemical bonds. A limonene molecule attacks those bonds. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom, delicious. And breaks it, that separates the polymers, and that pops the balloon. But remember, it only works with natural latex. So make sure you're using natural latex balloons. Second question, why do they call it limonene when it's in orange peels? I mean, yes, it's in lime peels and lemon peels, but the chemical itself smells like oranges. They should call it orangeine or, or citrus fruitinide or... Anyway, third question, should we max it out? Of course we should, come on. 200 balloons versus two bottles of limonene. Ready, go. attempt to max out our chemical rocket was 400 plastic containers. Oh yeah. That worked well, but now it's time to make the container larger. Whoa, giant maxed out chemistry rocket canister. I have a big plastic container with a groovy lid that sits there on airtight, which is great. And I have a giant jar of antacid. How many, it was like 60 antacid tablets or something? At least. This works exactly the same as our smaller containers. We dump the antacid in, seal the lid airtight, then flip it over. And now would be a good time to mention not to try this at home. Uh -huh. Okay, oh, it's not gonna oh, take long. So that was the canister version. Now we need the pop bottle version, the yes. rocket version. Yes. Okay, let's go make that. Let's do it. Okay. This is a light stick. It creates light using a chemical reaction. There's a liquid chemical inside and also a glass container that holds another chemical. When you bend the light stick, you break open the container and the two chemicals mix, creating light. There you go, light sticks, chemical reaction. And yes, of course we're gonna max it out. This is a whole bunch of the two chemicals in a light stick. Let's max it out. So how does a chemical reaction produce light? Well, a lot of chemical reactions produce energy. You might think of a chemical reaction producing heat. Well, heat is a kind of energy. This chemical reaction also produces energy, just energy in the form of light. It's just a different kind of energy. Whoa, back so light stick. <laughs> and now for a Science Max quiz. Chemical change or not. What's a chemical change? Well, let's demonstrate. Look at this. It's a happy little molecule of iron. And here's another molecule of oxygen. If they were to have a chemical change, they would react and form different molecules. Look, it's a molecule of rust. 
Rust is a different chemical than either iron or oxygen. It's a chemical change. Now, if these molecules mixed and did not change, then it's not a chemical change, it's a physical change. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a chemical change just by looking, but asking what kind of change it is leads to good science. So let's look at some examples. Vinegar and baking soda. Is it a chemical change? Yes. Vinegar and baking soda react to form different chemicals. Sodium acetate, that's the white stuff that's left over, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. How about a nucleation fountain with Diet Cola and mints? Haha! -ha. A lot of people think that's a chemical change, but it's not. The mints cause carbonation, the bubbles, to escape faster. But in the end, you still have cola and mints, no new chemicals. And without the carbonation, nothing happens. So, it's a physical change. Take a guess at this one. Glow stick chemicals. Well, producing light or heat is usually a sign of a chemical change. How about mixing sugar and water to make a sugar pop? That's a physical change. You start with sugar and water, you mix them, and when you have a sugar pop, what chemicals are you left with? Well, sugar and water. So, no chemical change. It can be hard to tell sometimes, but whenever two things mix, think to yourself if it's a chemical change or a physical change. And now you know it's either one or the other. And that's the first step to good science. Thanks for playing our Science Max quiz. Our maxed out rocket worked great. <laughs> <laughs> now to make it look more like a rocket. So we have a mesh bag here to put the antacid in. Right. And we have um, some paper clips attached to it. And what are the paper clips for? Well, Phil, we have a magnet. Ah. And so the magnet sticks to the paper clip. And so that's what we have here. You see the bag is full of the antacid tablets, which we put through the mouth of the bottle and the magnet is holding the paper clips on the other side of the plastic, so we can sort of move it along. So we can start with the bag over here where the water's down there, but now we attach the launcher, like so. All this effort is to keep the reaction from happening until the bottle's on the launcher and we're ready to go. And then as we pull the bottle over, we bring the bag up this side, and there, the water and the antacid have never touched. No reaction. All you need to do now is just, we pull this magnet away and the bag will fall into the water. And then we will have the launcher down here. And we pull the release and the rocket will go. We add some weight to the launcher to help keep it in place. Okay, right, wait, glass in. Safety first. Okay, ready? And then we pull the string with the magnet that drops the bag of antacid tablets in the water and starts the chemical reaction. Because we have a latch holding the bottle down, we can wait until the chemical reaction happens fully. And there's a lot of gas pressure in the rocket before... Three, Three two, two, one, one. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that worked. Yeah, I hit the ceiling. Uh, I think we need to do this outside. Yeah, I think we definitely have to do it outside. All right, totally great. Weird. Anyway, I was saying we should put three or four of them. Three, two, one, go! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> we tried it outside and it worked great. The only thing left was to max it out even more. So, larger chamber? Yep, more antacid. More antacid, more air, more water. Absolutely. Bigger rocket. Okay, so you know what? I know how to splice two bottles together, and we can increase the size right. of the chamber. This is sodium acetate. How do you get sodium acetate? Well, when you do a vinegar and baking soda reaction, what you have left, once the reaction is finished, is sodium acetate. It's a crystal, and you can do something fun with it that may seem familiar. You make a super-saturated solution of sodium acetate by heating water and dissolving as much as you can, and then, when it cools, you can get the crystals to reform. Now, if you did this with sugar, you could make a sugar pop, which we've done before. If you do it with salt, you could make a salt pop, which is less appealing. And if you do it with sodium acetate, you can do this. Just like with the sugar pop, all it needs is a seed crystal to get the crystals to reform. But unlike sugar, which takes a few days, sodium acetate recrystallizes right before your eyes. 
Because we heated the water, it allowed more crystals to dissolve in it. Ooh. But then it cooled down afterward. There's more crystals sitting around in this water than there should be at this temperature. They want to turn back into crystals, and all they need is something to start them going. I've colored this one green because, I don't know, science. Maybe it'll look cool. A tiny crystal on the end of the stick is all we need to start the reaction happening. Whoa! Wow! And there you go! Sodium acetate! Hmm. That one wasn't done yet. We've gone from small containers... Oh, yeah! ...to a large container... <laughs> ...to a rocket. Yeah! So what's next? Super maxed out rocket! Twelve two-liter bottles all spliced together to give us a very large chamber to build up pressure with. So the chamber is all the same. So it's all one big hollow tube. And now we're going to fire it off. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> ah! Awesome rocket. Yeah! Lisa and I follow the same procedure as before. We use a bag of antacid tablets held up inside the rocket with a magnet. And once it's sealed on the launcher, we pull it off, let the antacid mix with the water, let the chemical reaction happen for a while to produce enough gas pressure, and then we fire it. OK, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Oh, my god. shot a rocket on Science Max. That's amazing. Well done. Chemical Reaction Rocket. Thank you very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. We should build another rocket because that one so. is probably broken. That's done. OK, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so this time, I think what we should need to do is. Ah! Oh, no, it's nothing but garbage cans in there. we got to turn the portal off. Oh, come on, we got to get. 